but with your internal processes too. To help Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Oracle's Vice President, Global Business Development and Product Marketing, Harish Venkat. about several engineering systems. In the next 30 minutes, we plan to go over details. Oh. We plan to go over the details of several engineered systems, what they are, and how customers are realizing value out of them. Today, I have a panel of experts with me. Each of these distinguished individuals have been integral in the development of these products. On top of that, they've been working directly with customers to, to, to ensure they're maximizing the value of each of these products. It is my privilege that I want to introduce Wim Kokertz, Ashish Ray, Bob Tom, and Mike Workman. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. It's a pleasure to have you guys here. Let's start off talking about Oracle Database Appliance. ODA is a great appliance. Customer can deploy all of their applications and database in one single box. Bob, can you talk a little bit more about ODA? Sure. So the database appliance, we're now on the uh, fourth generation, I believe, of the database appliance. And it provides in a single package everything that you need to deploy a high availability database or application. We have two servers, we have storage, we have networking. Everything you need is in kind of a single package. And we kind of talk about it as it's complete, it's simple, reliable, and it's affordable. Complete means that we have everything that you need for both database and application. So everything you need, it's there. Simple means that it's easy to deploy. We have put wizardry and automation and other intelligence built in best practices. All these things are built right into it so that you don't need to have all these specialized skills and expertise in order to deploy a high availability database. It's reliable. Um, we have done lots of testing to make sure that the whole package itself works together before you deploy it. Uh, Juan talked about you want to be doing what thousands of other people have done. That's what you get with the database appliance, a configuration that thousands of other people have tested. Of course, it has all the reliability. It runs the Oracle high availability software, real application clusters. And lastly, it's affordable. It, uh, it's affordable in a couple different ways. We have capacity on demand licensing to make it less expensive to deploy. And we have a lot of automation that leads to simplicity, less time spent managing the system. So simple, reliable, affordable, and complete. Thank you, Bob. Virtual compute appliance is part of a growing infrastructure in converged infrastructure market. Wim, talk to us about VCA. How is it different than the rest of the products in the integrated infrastructure market? So when we started working on VCA, this really explains what it is and, and why we built it, is we wanted to make sure that from a customer point of view, you, you basically get a complete appliance that provides the networking, the storage, the compute power, the virtualization layer, the operating system, everything together. And the reason we started building this because we have experience in doing Linux support, operating system support, virtualization support. And most of the issues we had with customers was they purchase storage from one vendor, use service from another vendor, then get the software, try and install it, the wrong device drivers, and, and all this work of getting these things installed was very complex and error prone. And we spent most of the problem solving around getting different pieces of the stack to work together. So the virtual compute appliance is in many ways a best practices implementation of that entire stack. 
the networking is configured the right way, the compute nodes are configured the right way, and we bring everything up from our side. We have all the patches installed, all the orchestration of a new node comes in is done automatically by us. So from a customer point of view, you buy a big rack, you power it on, and we do everything. The hardware gets configured, the software gets configured, and all you care about is deploying virtual machines with any x86 operating system inside. Thank you, Wim. Flash storage is everywhere, Mike. Talk to us about FS1. What is it and why did we build it? Well, it's a, a flash storage array. Uh, it's uh, highly scalable, uh, two to 16 nodes, uh, uh, high availability nodes. And it scales up to petabytes, enormous amounts of flash, uh, and uh, about 80 gigabytes per second uh, in a two node configuration, um, or in a 16 node configuration. And, uh, and it, it's very flexible. Uh, it, we call it an all-flash array because it was designed for flash. It's different than uh, one of the old uh, style arrays in that it was designed for flash as, as opposed to disk. Uh, therefore, uh, the, the topology, the architecture is meant to express that performance. The reason why people are interested in flash, obviously, is for performance, replacing electromechanical structures, disks with, with solid state. And the idea of the system, including quality of service, storage domains, a lot of other features, uh, is to be a primary workhorse for the data center. You can deploy all flash configurations at the same time as using disk. So you get the economics of disk, the performance of flash, and it's uh, what we call, because of, of that flexibility and the dynamic range of scalability, the industry's first mainstream flash array. Excellent, thank you, Mike. Ashish, what are some of the conventional issues we're doing backup and recovery that led to Oracle to design and create the recovery appliance or Zero Data Loss recovery appliance? It's a good question, Harish. Um, see, uh, backup and recovery as an industry has existed since the several decades, right? What has also happened, the problems have also existed at the same time. Fundamentally, it's a problem of data loss, right? Your data is as good as the last backup, whenever that could be. Could be hours, could be days. Daddy alluded to that. So the problem is, if you take your backups and then you want to restore it later on, you lose all the intervening transactions, right? So that's the area of data loss. Lately, we have seen some innovations in the space of deduplication, but the way the deduplication solutions work is they work on a stream of bytes, and that's what it is, a stream of bytes, which means at their level, they do not distinguish that the stream of bytes come from a busy transactional database. Net-net, this means the duplication ratios often are unpredictable and poor when database backups and database blocks are concerned. And finally, we have this nagging issue of backup windows, See, today, a business aspires to be 24 by 7. Despite that, when a backup job kicks in, that means at that time frame, no critical business activity can run, which means productivity suffers. Thank you, Ashish. Let's switch gears. Let's talk about how customers are using these products. When you're out there talking to customers all around the world, talk to us about how VCA is helping them solve real-world business problems. Sure, so there are a number of different kinds of scenarios. So the first one is the ISPs, so service providers out there that in primarily host Oracle software or host a multitude of applications including Oracle products. And they want to make it one very easy and quick to get going in, in deploying new customers and, and adding new infrastructure to their environment. And one of the advantages of the virtual compute appliance is you get a big rack, you power it on, and about two hours later you're up and running and you can start provisioning software. And in the end, that's what the ISP is in the business for, is to deploy new application stacks, not to spend more money on figuring out which components work together and having sysadmins and hardware admins on site to, to maintain all these things and so forth. So that's been one example is, is sort of the ISP community that hosts different customers. Then the second one is the virtual compute appliance is sort of the general purpose appliance in front of all the other engineered systems. We're purpose built in that we use the same principles and the same software stack as the rest of the engineered systems, but it's general purpose run Windows, run Linux, run Solaris, run your own app, run any application inside that environment. 
So what we typically see is customers that are virtualizing databases in a more generic way, have third-party applications or Windows stuff around it, and then have a big rack, put all these things together, and then deploy that really efficiently. Thank you, Wim. Mike, talk to us about FS1. Where, where is FS, FS1 being used? Uh, in particular, Flash, and what sort of problems is FS1 solving today? Well, obviously, uh, flash, speed, and performance. Um, but agility, flexibility, uh, deployment as a single platform that does the job that competitors uh, take uh, 10 products uh, to cover. Um, there's applications where people are deploying uh, the FS1 as an all-flash array. Uh, those are really interesting. Speed, performance, scalability, uh, total capacity uh, of, of even a two-node array is uh, up to 175 uh, uh, um, terabytes, um, which is an enormous amount of flash relative to most people's two node arrays, top out 10 or 20. Um, that's an interesting application, playing to the flash. Um, at the same time, people are using it for archive. We have customers buying it as an all disk solution, and that's fine because we can meet the economics that people expect with disk. That's terrific. Perhaps the most interesting uh, to me is the ones where people are using the storage domains feature for the product. What that is is essentially, it, it's a, the FS1 is a virtualized storage array, but we step back just one step from that and allow people to define physical uh, domains within the storage pool that act as sort of virtual uh, uh, FS1s. So you can have you know, two, five, 25, domains. Each of these domains have their own resource, their own auto tiering, their own quality of service. They look like a little FS1. They can be an all flash domain, an all disk domain, and I think that the most interesting ones are where we have people who are configuring the machine to do disparate jobs. OLTP with all flash, two tiers, but with the four tiers you can do a great general purpose machine and build uh, archival solutions uh, using flash for index and metadata, those sorts of things, and, and use capacity disk or performance disk for the sort of the, the, the mid-ground, the bulk of the storage. And, and then we also have people using backup targets as just capacity disk. So I think those are the most interesting because they illustrate the flexibility and the power of the FS1 in the data center. Indeed, thank you, Mike. Ashish, talk to us about some of the top features of the uh, uh, back of ZDLRA, and how does it differentiate from similar products in the marketplace? Sure, Harish. So one of the most innovating features in, for the recovery appliance is how we have integrated with real-time redo transport. See, the redo block is a fundamental unit of change within the Oracle database. So what happens with the recovery appliance within a protected database, as these changes occur through redo blocks, these redo blocks are shipped directly from memory, from the SGA, directly to the recovery appliance. It's like an extended mem copy over the network. Thereby, these protected databases are really protected till the last sub-second, right? So from a recovery point objective perspective, this is huge. The second thing is we are minimizing any production server impact when backup jobs kick in, because now all the backup operations are consolidated on the recovery appliance. The protected databases, they're enabled with an incremental forever strategy, which means only the changes are shipped, no more full backups after the first initial full backup. And finally, what can also be enabled with the recovery appliance through the integration with enterprise manager cloud control, the IT executives, IT administrators, they have a real-time recovery view of the entire enterprise, of all databases across the enterprise, how these databases are doing from a recovery window perspective, from a data loss threshold perspective, and it doesn't matter. Tier zero, tier one, tier two, all these databases are now protected in a very streamlined manner with the recovery appliance. Thank you, Ashish. ODA, Bob, we know it's a great uh, platform for database. Through your customer interaction, tell us a little bit about how customers are using ODA. Okay, so as you said, the Dame database appliance gives away part of the story. It makes a great database platform uh, for running your OLTP databases, your data warehouses, or even your mixed workloads. Great platform, especially when you want to deploy high availability databases, because remember, we have everything there in order to run our high availability real application cluster stack. So you need a high availability database, no easier way to get it. 
Um, however, there's more than that. We have a lot of customers who are actually looking at it as a consolidation platform. Why? The X5-2 database appliance has three times the number of cores of the original database appliance. It's actually, we used to think of it as a little baby box. It's no longer a little baby box. It's a pretty capable system and a lot of customers can consolidate a lot and a lot of databases inside a single database appliance. So it makes it very cost effective for doing consolidation. Uh, the other thing that we see people with databases doing is using it for test and development. It has integrated snapshot capabilities, storage snapshots. You can quickly and, uh, you know, take a snapshot of a database and deploy it to a test or a development uh, uh, use case. And that's, you know, that's something that's um, built right into the system. There's nothing else to buy. It's single command and you've got yourself a database. Uh, remember, the database appliance runs the same stack as Exadata, so it's great for backing up either or testing either an Exadata or another database appliance. Lastly, we have, um, it's more than database appliance, we have the ability to run applications. Virtualization is integrated into the system, and because of that, we can run applications and the database inside the same box. We got a lot of ISVs embracing this. They're able to deploy solutions in a box um, and they can you know, save a lot of money that way by deploying a single solution to their customers. We've also worked with Oracle applications, so all of our applications run there in there as well. Thanks, Bob. We spoke a lot about acquisition cost and performance today. Let's talk a little bit about the ongoing cost associated with management. We know that's the bulk of the cost. So how does VCA help alleviate or some, reduce some of these ongoing management costs for them? So it's certainly one of the reasons that we think it's a great solution for customers, right? So there's probably three aspects to it. The first one is the hardware, then it's the software stack, and then it's the combination of hardware and software. One of the advantages of VCA is that when you buy the base rack, it's actually completely cabled top to bottom. So you can go up to 25 compute nodes in the rack, but you can purchase it with as few as two. So you buy the rack, it has two, then you need to add nodes. Well, all the cables to add that node are already in there, and they're labeled. So from a hardware admin point of view, if you need to add more capacity from a maintenance point of view, you buy an extra node, you plug it in, we have the cables already there, we, they're numbered and labeled, so it's very easy to plug them in, you power it on and you're done. You don't have to go and install the operating system or the virtualization software. We already do that for you. The VCA orchestration software will detect there's a new node added. It will install Oracle VM on it. It will, it will install all the right networking components on it, discover it in the same server pool, and bring it up. So you really don't have to do anything other than physically plugging in extra compute when it's needed. Then on the software side, we provide bundles of software for a patch that, that basically takes everything into account. Operating system updates, firmware updates, the updates for the storage appliance, updates for the networking, updates for the virtualization layer. All the device drivers that need to be updated, they're all bundled together, very similar again to what we do with all the other engineer systems. Basically, you get one patch bundle, you update it, and we automatically start installing this. In fact, we do it in a rolling fashion. One of the things we mentioned earlier was every component is HA. We will bring down one management node, switch to the other one, apply the updates to one. When it's updated, we switch back and do the updates on the other one. Once we start updating compute components, we'll migrate VMs to another node, we'll update the compute node, migrate the VMs back. So it's a completely hands-off mechanism where you don't have to worry about a new version of the software. Which firmware will work on which server that I purchased? Which version of this virtualization software will work with my storage or the storage plugins. So we basically take all that out of the picture and make it really easy for people to just focus on what they need. They want to bring up new VMs really quickly and they want to not maintain the box themselves. It just has to come automatically. Thank you, Wim. Mike, we know FS1 is Oracle's flagship offer for SAN. SAN is all about sharing storage resource for application workloads. What do we have in FS1 that delivers great application performance as well as its ease of manageability? Well, there's quite a few things, but I'll, I'll focus on three. Uh, f first and foremost, the, uh, the FS1 is built around a, a, a framework uh, called quality of service. Uh, it actually has been changed. That was the original. We actually changed it to, to uh, be quality of service plus. Um, at the core of quality of service is the fact that there's an enormous amount of control over RAID levels, sequential, caching, network, compute, et cetera, in the machine. That sounds a little daunting, but I'll get to why you don't have to worry about that so much. Um, above, quality, uh, above that control over the hardware is a, a prioritized uh, queue. 
essentially uh, storage since RAMAC used first in, first out queues in the uh, uh, FS1 has replaced that with a prioritized queue. And just simply put, that allows you to align business priorities with the execution of the storage system so that it does first things first. If you walk out of your house in the morning and, and your, your plan was to rake some leaves, <clears throat> even if that doesn't sound like a good plan, uh, if that was your plan and you noticed that there was a broken pipe, uh, you probably ought to drop the rake and go fix the pipe. Um, and, and that's what we all do in life. We do first things first. When there's an OLTP running your web store, you probably better do those IOs before you do test and dev uh, IOs. And the quality of service plus uh, in the FS1 allows you to align those business priorities with the resources and the execution of storage uh, transactions in the FS1. The second thing is storage domains. I talked about that already. Um, that allows you to go one step further than aligning priorities. It allows you to physically isolate uh, resources. And the third um, really important one is, is given that capability of the FS1 to do so many different things on four tiers of storage, auto tiering, and all of that stuff, how can I make it simple for the administrator? Uh, and the an answer is we have application profiles. So when you deploy an Oracle database or, or Windows Exchange server on the FS1, there's a drop-down box that goes in and it sets all those configurations to pre-tested configurations that are optimized to match the attributes of the way that the storage handles the workload which are disparate between different applications and the way the FS1 is configured to give you the best dollars per IOP and the best dollars per terabyte. That's what the thing does. So those three things in concert make a very powerful core storage system for your data center. Very, very compelling. Thanks, Mike. Bob, ODA is known to reduce database administration and lowering mm -hmm. costs. How do we actually make this magic happen? Well, we already talked about some of the things. Simplicity, remember I said it's complete, simple, reliable, and affordable, right? The key here is simple. We've baked in a lot of best practices, a lot of automation. Uh, it was funny, the description Wim gave of, to, of turning on the VCA, it's actually very similar to many of the things that we've done with the database appliance. We've made it very, very simple. We've, we've um, automated things. We've taken patch bundles and we tested everything and make sure that it works together so that you don't have to spend a lot of time researching best practices, researching patch com compatibility, researching this, researching that, right? We've, we controlled the stack, we made sure that it works together. So um, imagine that you have a, you're an ISV and you suddenly have an application and you wanna ship it out you know, to a customer. Rather than sending somebody on site for weeks at a time to try and build up a hardware stack or get it running on the customer's equipment, you can actually almost drop ship something in there. And the less time that somebody spent on site trying to work on things, the less, you know, that's a huge opportunity cost as well as just, you know, a reduction in time spent in hotels and other such things. So big savings there. In fact, solution in a box is one of the use cases I didn't get to that, you know, really allow people to, um, people are really, especially ISVs are really excited about. Um, there's other ways that uh, you, know, you can save money, just the pure cost of somebody doing something. You have administrators, they're expensive skills, sometimes they're hard to find. You're paying them a lot of money. You do, do you want them sitting there doing mundane deployments and kind of patching exercises over and over, or do you want to spend those resources on higher value, um, more valuable tasks to the organization? You probably want to spend them on those more valuable things. So time that's not spent deploying, patching, scratching your head and figuring out why things don't work, why there's incompatibilities, that leads to real savings. Thank you, Bob. And finally, Ashish, talk to us about the overall value of the recovery appliance for any mission critical business. Sure, Harish. Um, see, um, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of critical gaps in this area of data protection and recovery appliance fills those gaps. I talked about how it eliminates data loss exposure within the enterprise. So any costs associated with data loss, those costs are now eliminated with recovery appliance. I also talked about how by offloading backup operations to the recovery appliance and also enabling an incremental forever strategy, we can eliminate this whole concept of backup windows. So that improves productivity throughout the enterprise. I also talked about how IT managers, IT administrators, IT executives could now have an end-to-end -end view of the state of data protection and the state of data recovery, real-time manner, across the entire enterprise. That improves the manageability costs. 
And finally, as data explosion happens, as your business grows, as number of databases grows, what happens with the recovery appliance? You can scale out very easily, dynamically, but not only just adding capacity. We can scale out with increased compute and increased networking bandwidth without any impact on existing production servers. So that really is huge. See, Harish, at the end of the day, we can talk about a lot of innovate, innovation, a lot of new features, and the benefits they provide. If you look at this state of data protection and backup and recovery, if you ask any IT administrator, what is your number one pain point? My chances are that, my, my, the chances are that he or she will probably say backup and recovery management. What we have done with recovery appliance is eliminate the costs associated with fragmented backup and recovery management. We have made it vastly streamlined and much more standardized, kind of like a global standard that both Larry and Juan alluded to. Thank you, Ashish. And I want to thank the rest of the panelists as well. So I hope you guys found this informational and very uh, insightful. I want to thank you guys for your participation, both online as well as in the auditorium, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Oracle's Vice President of Big Data and Advanced Analytics, Neil Mendelson. Great, so thank you for hanging in there. I, uh, I uh, love talking about this topic. It's my favorite topic, big data. And as you heard Larry talk this morning, I'm actually gonna focus mostly on the gravy, right, rather than on the meat, right? I love the meat, I love the gravy. After I got married, I learned to love tofu, right? I actually enjoy it now, believe it or not. So, <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's get started here. So if we take a look for a minute, uh, could you advance the slide, please? Okay. If we back up just a moment and ask ourselves, what is this big data stuff all about, right? Well, really, big data and digital transformation really go hand in hand, right? These two things are really much part of a much larger economic story, right? Where businesses and organizations and governments are looking to leverage information, data, about people and places and things, right, to drive new businesses. Right, to increase efficiency and to focus on customer experience. In fact, these results came from a Sloan survey right, a number of years back when they were asking customers or people where they expected to focus their big data efforts. Right? The number one uh, area that came out was here in customer experience. Right? And in fact, <clears throat> we all are customers ourselves, right? We experience that both in shops and online, and we're always endeavoring to get that better experience, right? Why is that more important today than ever before? Because truly competition, right, is greater today than it perhaps it ever was before in the past. And not just like competition, right? Not just banks competing against banks. Right? But telcos now offering banking services. And banking services, b banking companies willing to essentially pay your telco bill in order to do business with them. Right? So we're getting unlike competitors that are really mixing it up. Right? In the operational efficiency area, we're seeing big data playing a role there as well. Right? So let's take an example from the financial services industry. So increasingly, uh, regulators are asking banks and financial services companies to keep more and more information online and available for stress tests and for audits. Now, from the Financial Institute's perspective, this is just an added burden cost, right? So what they're trying to do, right, is to adhere to the regulatory requirements, but to do so without breaking the bank. Right? And big data, the usage of these technologies, right, these commodity, these industry standard technologies are helping people drop the cost, right, but still be able to keep more data online than they would otherwise be able to do before. And finally, we come to new net new business models, right? 
And we see these cropping up all over, right? Where businesses that didn't exist before, right, are now making businesses out of selling information and selling data, right? And in fact, we're seeing increasingly jockeying, right, for who's got more data about you or me, right, or others, right? We're seeing examples, again, in the financial services industry where you might see the banks themselves looking to offer services to their clients. You're seeing the credit card companies wanting to offer services to those banks. And everybody is looking to disintermediate everyone as it comes to the information, because the information is really that, informa is really that uh, capital, right? That new asset that they're looking to take advantage of, right? So we started off looking at customer experience. And we have a short video to really take a look at one such customer that used a big data appliance in order to approach their customer experience uh, uh, data work, uh, uh, big data project. And why don't we play the video? The Pesh Group is a multimedia publishing company active in the Netherlands and Belgium, both Europe. Uh, we publish eight newspapers in both countries, uh, more than 25 magazines. We have some huge websites, uh, more than 6 million unique visitors per day on all our websites together. We also are active in broadcasting with television and radio, commercial both, in the Netherlands and most of those activities in Belgium. The company strategy is in fact a customer-centric strategy. So we want to get a 360 view about our customers and about our prospects. And the big data project helped us to achieve that goal. You know, one of the areas in which we were able to achieve beautiful results using big data is the churn prediction. Uh, based on all the data in, uh, that we collect on websites and on your behavior, payment behavior and so on, we were able to make a prediction model which with an accuracy of 92% is able to predict that you probably won't renew your newspaper anymore. So our approach to renewal is completely different to the people in that segment and towards the other people. And this has brought us a lot of value and a lot of customers who didn't stop the newspaper or else they would have done so. The selection of the big data appliance was quite easy. Uh, we went for the uh, Oracle big data appliance as it was uh, very quick to install, very easy to install as well. And it was far more cheaper than building our own Hadoop cluster. So it was in fact a no-brainer. We could of course have uh, built our own Hadoop cluster and we did the exercise and we did the maths. Uh, we would have needed at least 12 servers, uh, we would have to support the servers, there had to be software on those servers and so on. And uh, we compared that solution with the uh, Oracle uh, Big Data Appliance. I must honestly say I didn't think at first place that uh, this would be affordable to us. But when we compared both solutions, the Oracle solution was by far cheaper uh, than the uh, Hadoop cluster and required less management as well. So that's why we went for the Oracle solution. Great, so that's a really good example, right, from another industry. In this particular case, the multimedia industry. Incredibly competitive, right? Here they are with newspapers, right, and other media projects, right? Dealing with how do they essentially keep customers in the fold, right? How do they identify them? How do they predict when someone is about to churn and give them an offer, right, of perhaps something on the web, other content they have in order to continue to have them as a customer? And of course, I think one of my favorite parts is you can hear Luke kind of like almost laugh a little bit, thinking that, well, we didn't think we could afford this, right, from Oracle, right? And that's really Larry's original point, right, is you wouldn't think, right, that less expensive, that lower initial cost of that machine would come from Oracle, right? Traditionally, we focused on value, right? And now, right, with big data appliance and other engineered machines, we get the opportunity to compete both on price and on value, both on the meat and on the gravy, right? It's an exciting time. So um, it's, uh, just moving forward, so how does one put together one of these configurations? How did De Piers Group actually start? So if you could advance, thank you. So here's our latest offering, right, the X5-2. Right? Now this latest machine, right, we've more than, compared to the previous model, the X4, right, we've more than doubled the number of cores, right, uh, 2.25 times more, 
right? Double the amount of memory. We have the latest version of Cloudera Hadoop on the machine, and it's exactly the same price as the previous model, right? So we've taken the advantage, right, of these industry standards, right, in memory and in the two-socket CPUs, uh, two-socket uh, servers that Larry talked about, and we're able to pass on, right, those uh, increases in power, increases in memory to our customers, right, while keeping the price constant. So an even more powerful box than before, right? And you can see we spent a lot of time trying to balance the amount of CPU that's in the box, the incredible networking that's in the box, right, as well as the storage that's in the box as well, right? Um, <clears throat> and talk about a little extra things that we provide, a little of the gravy, as Larry said, right? On the hardware side, from a support point of view, these machines are able to essentially dial home when they have issues, right? I mean, I do that, I'm sure you probably do as well, right? And as things are starting to happen, maybe a disk is beginning to show signs of a potential failure in the future, it will phone home and let our support center know that it's in that condition, right? And that allows us to essentially dispatch a technician to replace that disk before it fails, right? Big data being used to apply on a big data machine, right? Try doing that, right, when you build your own cluster. On the software side, we provide a full complement of software, right, starting with Oracle Linux, continuing on to Cloudera's Enterprise Data Hub Edition. Now, we spent a good amount of time looking at the various distributions that were on the market, right, as well as taking it directly from Apache, right? And <clears throat> from our uh, evaluation, Cloudera offered two things, right? Both, we thought, right, the stability of their business model and the depth of their technology to really end up being uh, here with us going forward in the future, right? And last year you saw a major investment from Intel, right, along with others in Cloudera. So now we have the opportunity to not only partner with Cloudera, but also to partner with uh, our longstanding partner, Intel, in conjunction with Cloudera as well. So it's kind of an exciting triad that's developed here. So in addition to Cloudera, we have the R distribution. If you're not familiar with R, um, when I went to university, if you were in a math or a physics or an engineering program and you were learning statistics, you were likely to be introduced to SAS. Today, if you're in, in university, you're gonna be interested, you're gonna be introduced to R. Right? It's an open source framework for statistical and predictive analytics. And we provide that on the box along with our NoSQL distribution. Right? And again, from a software point of view, right, a lot of these distributions right, come from small startup companies. And these small startup companies are all largely in the United States. So if you're an international customer right, and you have an issue that happens on a national holiday, perhaps in the United States, and you need support, or it's the weekend, right? Who are you gonna call, right? In our case, we make that support available to you seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, right? It's important for us to be able to make these machines enterprise ready and enterprise worthy, okay? And again, the value goes beyond hardware and software, right? The machine itself is pre-configured and pre-tuned, right? There are dozens and dozens and dozens of Unix parameters alone that are necessary to be tuned in order to get an efficient use out of your Hadoop cluster, right? We've done that work for you, right? And we provide integrated management, so you could manage this uh, uh, environment as a single entity, right? In fact, if you're used to using Enterprise Manager, right, across your other uh, Oracle properties, engineered machines and the like, you can use Enterprise Manager to check the health of this machine along with everything else. So the people in operations that are used to monitoring machines, right, can monitor it in exactly the same way that they're used to monitoring every, health, every other machine that they have from Oracle, right? But we also offer you something that in a world like Hadoop and NoSQL is really important. And that is a single command line to be able to do both patching and upgrades. There are hundreds and hundreds of components that are necessary, software components, firmware components, right? 
all kinds of different Linux components, Hadoop components, all kinds of different components that come together, right, that are necessary in order to make this thing actually work, right, to be able to make it perform, right? And each one of these individual software pieces, should you decide to build it yourself, issue their own independent patches, issue their own independent upgrades, right? It's really difficult for any one customer to figure out, right, when there's a problem, which pieces they're an issue with, right? Or can I actually go ahead and patch the operating system and what will it end up doing to my NoSQL database? We've taken that those issues, we've taken those problems off the table and we do it for you, right, all in a single entity, right? And we keep up the pace, right? One of the questions that we're asked often is, well, you know, if you're doing this, right, and you're providing the upgrades, how long does it take for you to keep current with the latest cloud era distribution, right? Because this world is moving very quickly. And the answer to that is, we generally release on the order of something like anywhere from three to six weeks after a major release, right? And we've kept that track record now for a number of years. And in fact, we're releasing every quarter, right? Net new software as well as patches, right? <clears throat> On the security side, when we talk about enterprise ready, we've got to talk about security, right? So what we try to do again is to build security right into the box, right? We provide encryption as data lands on the box, both at rest and on the wire. We provide various authentication services as well. And we also integrate into other Oracle security services like Audit Vault, right? Now, if you're looking to take Hadoop out of the laboratory and move it into real production, right, then you've got to be able to have mature security that you can depend upon, right, for all this data that you're accumulating together. And again, this is an area that we've tried to focus on as well. So you've built a system. Now let's see if I can move to the next slide. You've built a system, right? You've got it up and running, right? And believe it or not, this can happen really fast. We had an independent organization look at typically how long it takes someone to build up their own Hadoop cluster, right? And the answer to the question was that by the time they end up deciding what they need to build, buying and acquiring all the various pieces, configuring it together, tuning it together, right, and actually putting an application on, it takes on the order of something like six months, right? In our case, we can literally do this in a matter of days, right? Stand up a machine. It's ready to load data. And when it comes to loading data, we also offer a full integrated suite of products for both data integration and data governance, right? Now, Oracle has long offered uh, various technologies in this area. We've extended these technologies into the Hadoop platform as well. They run natively on Hadoop. They take native advantage of many of the technologies that we're seeing, memory technology like Spark and other uh, uh, technologies that we can leverage directly on Hadoop directly in order to help do this, right? As well as providing the data cleansing and data validation that is necessary. So we stood up a system, we've loaded some data, what's next, right? The next step tends to stop a lot of people in their tracks, right? We've got data, right? Lots of data, right? Maybe it comes from a, a number of different data sources. How do I make sense of it, right? That for a lot of people is a really a vexing problem. So what we've been, what we're offering here is something called big data discovery. Right? And the idea here is that we're going to use the machine, right? that as data begins to land on the machine, we're going to use machine learning algorithms to begin to look at the data, profile the data, catalog the data. Right? And it allows a user to easily begin to put together data sets that they might want to analyze, right? rather than having to do this all manually by writing code. It's a beautifully stunning visual product, right? In fact, the guys call it the visual face of Hadoop, right? I thought that was kind of clever, right? So you've got this data, right? It's been profiled, right? Now what I want to do is I want to find some correlations. I want to be able to see the data, right? Not by looking at long tabular reports scrolling across the screen as fast as they go. What can I derive out of that? I want to be able to see it. 
right? So here, in the same product, I get to bring up right, a visual interface that allows me to see and correlate various pieces of information in order to begin to better understand what I actually could do, find better insights, discover new realities, right, or discover what the reality happens to be, right? Now I built the system, I loaded some data, right? I'm learning about the data, I've discovered some data, right? Now what I want to do, right, is I want to take that next step, right? And that next step Luke talked about in terms of being able to identify, predict those customers that might churn. So for prediction and statistical uh, uh, analysis, right, we offer uh, the Oracle R distribution. Now, for many of you may know that R from open source, right, comes out of the box running on a single node, right? Now the beauty of Hadoop is that it scales out horizontally, right? And by default, the R distribution does not scale across multiple nodes, right? So we've taken the R distribution and we've built on top of it, right, so that many of the algorithms that are offered within R, we parallelize for you and it allows to scale out and take full advantage of the Hadoop system, right? But not only can we run R in Hadoop directly, we built R directly in the database, right? So you can build a model on your Hadoop system, right? And then when you want to go test it, you can essentially stick it right into the database in order to test it. You don't have to rewrite it, right? Years ago when I was at a startup, we used R, right, in order to do our predictive modeling. But then when we went to operationalize it, we then had to take the R model and write it in code, right, in order to actually get it to scale, right? Here, you don't have to do that, right? You can get it to scale on Hadoop, and you can get it to scale within the database, right? And in addition to R, right, we also offer SQL-based data mining, right? So, you know, this has been used successfully by many companies, right, to build data mining algorithms directly into the applications themselves. In fact, if you're users of Oracle's applications, you'll see any number of cases in the sales predictive side of our CRM applications that they're using this technology to build directly into the application, right, using a SQL-based technology, right, the ability to discover and to model and to predict, right? So, just uh, moving on. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've talked a lot about, about Hadoop and we've talked about some of the challenges, right? Now, one of the biggest challenges in data management is that frankly, life used to be a lot simpler, right? When I began originally at Oracle, right? I like to tell people I started at Oracle before SQL was a standard. You figure that out, right? <coughs> there was relational databases and there was SQL, right? And SQL was the language that you talked to relational databases, right? And life was good, right? And over the years, SQL has been dramatically enhanced and we've added additional capabilities inside of the language, right? A lot of people think of SQL as just being a language that can talk to structured information. That's actually not true. Years ago, we began to expand this the SQL language, and not just Oracle, but the industry itself, to be able to talk to unstructured information, semi-structured information, right? XML information. In the latest release of the Oracle 12C database, we can now talk directly to JSON documents that are in the database itself. So SQL is not simply a language to talk to structured information. It can talk to both structured and unstructured. Okay, so we've got that, SQL. We've got it, right? Relational, we've got it. But now we have these other technologies, right? We have Hadoop and we have NoSQL, right? If you could advance, please. Thank you. So in Hadoop, classically, we think of how do you actually talk to Hadoop, right? In the beginning, right, MapReduce is probably the, program, the programmatic framework that's most associated with Hadoop itself, right? It's a programming framework, right? So in order to be able to get data out of Hadoop to query information, you have to know how to write MapReduce. 
Now today, there are a lot of other ways to be able to get information out of Hadoop, other programmatic interfaces. But the key is they're programmatic interfaces, right? And what this ends up leading to is yet again silos of information. Information in Hadoop, information in NoSQL, informational in relational databases, right? And what we want to do is to bridge that, right? Now, over the last six to eight months, right, we've seen something interesting happen in the industry, which is now all of a sudden we're seeing SQL, a huge resurgence of interest in SQL, right? Of course, from our perspective, it never went away, right? I tell my son, look, you know, SQL's cool again. He looks at me, you know, oh, you see him just over the computer screen. He goes, you know, Dad, you were never cool. It's like, yeah, that's true, right? But SQL's cool, right? So now, right, what we need to be able to do is we need to extend it over there, right? So we're now seeing the emergence of SQL-based query engines running on top of NoSQL. So you can get an Apache project that will run SQL over Cassandra, right? And Mongo's offering something similar, right? And two, you can also find technology SQL engines that are running on Hadoop as well, right? But those SQL engines, first and foremost, only run on top of that framework, right? So if you run that SQL engine, you're only gonna, gonna get information from that data source itself. So you're only gonna get information from Hadoop, you're only gonna get information from NoSQL. What you won't have is you won't bridge it across. And in fact, it's ironic that if you go back only a few years, when we said SQL, we generally assumed that it reached a certain level of capability, right? The lowest level of capability that we used to talk about was SQL 92, and now that's long ago been surpassed. And what's interesting about these new arrivals on these NoSQL and Hadoop platforms is while they say they're SQL based and they are, they're a radical subset of the SQL language. So you can't express in the SQL dialect the kind of power, right, that you're used to when using a modern SQL interface. So what did Oracle do? We're providing, as Larry talked about, big data SQL, right, that bridges across these three divides. And it allows you right, in one query, right, one fast query, right, the same query that you use today, right, if you've got BI tools and you've got applications that are written on top of SQL today that you're running against an Oracle database and now you're putting data in Hadoop and NoSQL, those tools and those applications right out of the box without any changes will run directly across these new technologies as well right, spanning that for you, and they're gonna do it fast, right? So let's look at a use case, okay? So in this particular example, we've got customer information in the Oracle database, it's pretty typical, right? Information about customers' transactions, about their previous behaviors and so forth, and we've got web logs that are going into the Hadoop system, right? And the objective here is not to move all the information from the customer databases over to Hadoop so that you can now query it together, nor do we want to move all the information from Hadoop, right, these new data sources over to the relational engine, right? The volumes are just too big, right? We want to leave it where it is, and we want to query it in place, right? And we're using a technology that came originally from the Exadata machine, right, SmartScan. And what SmartScan does on Exadata is that it pushes right, the predicates, it pushes the filtering down toward the storage layers, and it takes what is a large amount of information, right, and pulls back a small amount of that, filtering it, right, to feed it to, into memory and to have it processed by the CPUs, right? We took that same innovation, right, and that's what inspired Big Data SQL, moving that over to uh, Hadoop, right, and NoSQL. So what you're able to do is when you execute that query, right, we're gonna be able to automatically figure out where the information lies, it is in Hadoop, is it in NoSQL, is it in relation, relational, and we're gonna parse out that query, and we're gonna do the filtering and the predicate pushdown very, very close to the data nodes on the Hadoop system, 
right, as well as on the relational systems. And because we're able to do that, and we're processing far less information, it goes a whole lot faster, right? So one fast query over all your data, right? And not just the query itself, right, but the same database security policies that you have in place, which may include advanced things like redaction, are now applied across NoSQL and Hadoop as well. Okay, so to sum it all up, Larry began really his conversation talking about that remarkably lower initial cost of ownership, right? And it's absolutely true here as well, right? The initial purchase price of a big data appliance is less than you can build it yourself, right? As he says, even without all the gravy, right? That initial purchase price. And then when you take a look at the price over a three-year period of time, it gets even better, right? And not just in terms of the price, right, either initial or over a longer period of time, but also because of the gravy, right, because of all the extra stuff that we built in, right, the time to be able to get one of these systems up and running, the time to be able to start providing value back to the business is cut by a dramatic amount. And that's what we need to be doing today, right, in information technology. We have to be delivering benefits to the business faster. So lower initial price, lower initial cost, and dramatically faster time to benefit, right? Okay, so just from a summary point of view, big data, its last name is data, right? Data is what we've been all about from the very, very beginning, right? We have a history of taking disruptive technology, right? Whether that disruptive technology came in the form of mini computers, client server, the internet, and now cloud and big data. We have a track record of taking that disruptive technology and turning it into enterprise productivity and value for a business. And that's exactly what we're doing, right, with our engineered systems and the big data appliance. And with that, I thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you. 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 Thank you.